like old people, so everyone is like pinching you know, like uh, cheeks and so on. And uh, what do you think about us coming back to Belgrade? You know, and, and she really like looked around. I saw that she is giving it a, a, a thought, and uh, and she said, mm, yes, I really love Belgrade. You know, but like. Everyone is white, and everyone speaks just one language, and uh, all these women are dressed the same, you know. So there was this kind of almost like monolith, you know, like uh, in appearance at least, you know, of something that she, as a London girl, was really not feeling comfortable with, you know. Everyone looked the same, you know, just one language, and for me, it was like almost like a little, I don't know, alert. Like she's totally accustomed and familiar with something. Else, I don't even notice the things. I don't even notice that everyone is white and, and kind of speaks Serbian. But she picked it up immediately, you know, at the age of seven, you know. So with identities, what I, I think that Maria can also speak a little bit, you know, it's not only uh, our ethnicities that are identities. It's also our roles as partners, as mothers, as daughters, you know. So for me, in Maria's film, it was really striking, you know, her identity as a daughter, you know, and then this new territory, the motherhood, that you kind of uh, occupied, but in a way not, again, feeling really comfortable. And you do say, you know, like you question how good you, you, uh, you are as a mother, because there is this essentialist use that the moment you give birth, you become this uh, amazing mother. That's not true. Uh, and uh, it, it's a big kind of a learning curve and a, a struggle in a way. Um, so when you give birth to a child, you give birth to yourself as a mother, and it's not always comfortable. So it's a kind of a transition. So I don't know, maybe we can also talk not only about the roles, but identities with these things. Yeah, regarding how Sweden is uh, like coming into territory of my identity, I cannot really answer now because I'm only two years there, and all of my answers were I think focus on the language because, uh, for example, uh, we were uh, we were staying in a friend's house here, and uh, somebody asked me, uh, "What is Pavlaka? It's a Serbian for uh, sour cream. Sour cream. How do you say it in Croatian?" And uh, Swedish. Uh, word came to me, not Croatian one. So I can only talk about, but I think it doesn't have to do with identity, it has to do with language more. But what I wanted to say, uh, it's in interesting because when you're in Croatia and when somebody asks you, uh, what are you from, uh, what's your ethnicity or whatever, then of course I answer I'm a, a, a Serb living in uh, Croatia. But in Sweden, if somebody asked me, okay, what are you? I'm a Croatian, and uh, full stop. I don't uh, elaborate on that anymore because it doesn't make sense. They wouldn't understand that at all. When I start to, uh, to uh, when I try to elaborate on them, the story of Yugoslavia, they don't understand. So. I have just a little bit to add there on sort of personal feelings and institutional or marketing feelings. So um, my British publisher always bills me as a Serbian writer. You will see that on Wikipedia, etc. That's absolutely fine because it makes me more exotic and that sells books. But at the same time, when I went to uh, um, uh, Serbia in 2005, for example, uh, Britain was a guest of honor, and uh, um, I was the British guest. I opened the uh, British book, I opened the uh, Belgrade Book Fair, and all the newspapers reported it as British writer of Serbian origin. And that doesn't quite feel right. I mean, first of all, Yugoslavia disappeared, but also the Serbian origin. I still feel that I'm there as well as here. And it becomes, once you have to kind of put it down on paper precisely, it becomes very complicated. At the same time, I had the experience where, so I got very annoyed with British Council this summer because they wouldn't send me to Romania as a British writer. They had this little delegation, and I wanted to go to Romania. My uh, novel is a bestseller there at the moment. And I asked them why, and they said, because last time we sent you to Poland, 
All the journalists wanted to ask you about Serbia all the time. So the journalists come, I give a press, press conference, there's no, it was new British voices, but 99% of questions were about Serbia. So it feels completely out of my control there. I just kind of let it be defined. It was very interesting at the same time, because we were talking about children. My son, who is 19 now, uh, second year at university, one of the first things he did when he went to university, so went away from home, he joined the Yugoslav society at his university. Where does this come from? And he said, that's where the cool kids came. <laughs> he liked the food and he liked the girls, right? It's, so, it's, it's actually quite funny how that, you know, sort of accidents in a way. So I see you in that row and I could see my son just joining you as well. Do you have anything to add to this? No? We can go to the next question. Thank you. Um, it's, the question strays a bit from, from the topic of your plan, so, so feel free to sweep it aside. It is a, um, the question is really whether Yugoslavia was a sustainable project, whether the state, uh, I mean, whether it had any future after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I, I'm thinking of something that Branko Milanovic, for instance, wrote about it in a blog recently. But I can link it to what has been said before, maybe linking to what Vladimir said about himself, finding himself in the archives, reading about ideas and projects whose ruins he saw in the street. Um, in a way, one can see history as finding out in the past <coughs> futures that didn't happen. Uh, there were uh, at every stage of history and many possibilities but that were not taken. Uh, those projects ended up in ruins because things went one way, but they could have gone the other way. Maybe this is one way of you know, understanding history. Um, should you should you wish to to go back to to Yugoslavia, maybe in '45, uh, was it a doomed project? Uh, could it only survive in a divided world? Or uh, I, mean, this is a I think well, uh, well, Vladimir um, thinks about that. I would just say something about uh, really uh, something that I wrote about for um, a book, a collection of essays in Yugoslavia. Um, it failed twice. And it is not an accident that it was formed in 1918 and then in 1945 it was formed again because there is a strong desire there for, for Yugoslavia. So in some ways it is both doomed but it also refuses to go away. There's a sort of statement about, uh, by, uh, or something that Amartya Sen wrote somewhere, which is that there are failed solutions that refuse to go away. And this is something that refuses to go away. And the reason is that when Yugoslavia was falling apart, and uh, one of the reasons, and uh, EU was encouraging particular nationalist projects, which kind of contradiction, there were two million Yugoslavs in Yugoslavia. Two million is much bigger than several of the nations that now are independent. And those two million people were not listened to. The, you know, their voices simply didn't count in part because they were not territorially grouped. Perhaps if we sat somewhere in the center, we <laughs> might have grabbed a bit of land and you would still have had Yugoslavia. It's a kind of, it's, it's, so it's a sort of, it's an interesting thing because in hindsight, it's a bit like a marriage that falls apart. You can say it was doomed from the start, but there were two attempts and there was, there was a very good reason why there were two attempts. Rebecca West, whom I sometimes quote, actually chose to write about Yugoslavia. People now talk about her as pro-Serbian, and there is a good reason for that. But she chose to write about Yugoslavia because it was a multinational project against imperialism. So that's why she went there first. And that kind of utopian thought is incredibly strong. And I think it's still strong there. It's still strong, and in Tsetinska Street uh, in Belgrade, where I uh, frequently, frequent uh, when I'm in Belgrade, there is my favorite graffiti, which is the Balkansku Socialistichku Federaciju, which reads for Balkan Socialist Federation, which will happen, believe me, sooner or later. And on that note, Vladimir, who, in, uh, by the way, he's, uh, as a historian, as a researcher, and uh, academic, uh, he's, as I said, his book was uh, exactly about that period, which was a very turbulent pe period, so 50s, from the end of the Second World War till the non moment in 1961, where uh, loads of criticism was about opening up the market, and you can tell more because you're more knowledgeable than myself. But uh, in this film, Occupied Cinema, there was one line 
where this activist says uh, war started because of privatization. You know, there was a there needed to be a good reason for all these public goods to be privatized. Yeah. So can you uh, elaborate on this? Right. How to keep this to one minute? <laughs> okay. One, one minute. Well. We can just occupy this space and yeah. stay at the Alpinos. <laughs> I've got a plane to catch, mate. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, but history as, as alternatives, yeah, I mean, I, I think Vesna Ves has already said a lot of what I might have wanted to say. Um, you know, the anti-fascist struggle in the Second World War, I think, was an amazing feat. Um, the Yugoslav army claimed something like, the Pakistan army claimed something like 800,000 people carrying arms at the end of the war. It's a massive population. Another aspect of Yugoslav history which is totally forgotten, which I think ought to be mentioned, um, Stefan is wearing a t-shirt of the AFG, the Anti-Fascist Women's Front. And, yeah, it was the largest women's movement in Europe at the time. Possibly the world, I wouldn't go quite that far, I don't know what about China, but you know, proportionally I suspect it would have been. Um, so there were lots of, you know, incredibly important things that happened in Yugoslavia in the Second World War. At the same time, I'm very skeptical that the state that came out of it had the seat of anything that I would call, in a sense, a real alternative. Um, sounds incredibly arrogant. I, I you know, I'm a, I disagree with everyone in the room. But um, you know, Dan Jovic, another historian of Yugoslavia, you know, an old-time friend of mine, and so on. We sat in the archives together once in Tito's archive, which, for a time, limited access to two people at a time. Right? So he was sitting right next to me. He was far more experienced and, you know, sitting through lots of documents where I was kind of trying to make up my mind what I'm doing. And he says to me, so it's interesting. I've just found a document that pretty much says Tito handpicked every delegate of the Anti-Fascist Liberation Council in 1943. Right. So, I mean, you know, this was meant to be a democratic moment where people send delegates from all over the country representing a new, fundamentally different kind of democracy handpicked by the man himself. Um, you know, I didn't really write about that period, but I can say in terms of the setting up of the workers' councils, which is a kind of total Yugoslav claim to fame in the Cold War, you know, it's fun we're fundamentally different from both East and West because we have workers' councils. You know, and Yugoslavia had probably the greatest participatory attempt in the Cold War, it was still an incredibly top-down story and it was thought up in a way which was about presenting quote-unquote from Edward Cartel, who was obviously the main ideologue of the system, to show the difference between us and them, the Soviet bloc. You know, in a way to say to the West, we're different and we need your help. From the very beginning, as far as I can tell, it was an instrumentalized system. At no point in time did workers have real power in that system. So in a sense, my answer to that would be there were different variations. It didn't have to collapse as a country. Um, and actually, uh, as you were saying, you know, one could go on about the Yugoslavia being a very narrow form of the Balkan Federation, which uh, has a longer history and I would like to think is a stepping stone to different European world and so on, right? Um, but at this moment, I, uh, you know, um, I would say as a system, the Yugoslav system that was set up was never going to be an emancipatory one in that sense. We had a, a, a moment this summer when we were talking about what Yugoslavia would look like now if it was in, in the EU and whole, if it never fell apart. And it was a beautiful moment, but obviously it was just completely impossible. Because when you think about the EU, it actually allowed membership from former Yugoslavia in order of ethnic purity, and it will continue like that. The place that is most mixed, Bosnia in the center, will probably be the last to join. Um, so, I mean, there's a lesson from the outside as well. We have time, I think, just for one more question, yeah? Or no? Oh, we, have, we have more, 20 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll be quick. Uh, so my question is about, I guess, the thing being, storytelling in the post Yugoslav context and identities. Um, the salience of the Yugoslav identity in the future. So I think something that's come up quite a bit is this generational uh, divide might be too strong a word, but you have people who grew up in Yugoslavia and are quite familiar with it, and then those who came after and maybe now are becoming 
connect future generations more connected to a specific country as opposed to Yugoslavia. And there is certainly this ego nostalgia and this romanticized element and this idealization. Um, but I guess for future generations, do you think Yugoslavia will be as salient, as interesting, as something they feel connected to? Or will, with time, that kind of dissipate as people who no longer have that lived experience also pass? would like to take this question. There's someone in the audience, someone in the audience who wants to answer. <laughs> it's a good question. It's this, just a, yeah, yeah. It's a big question. This seems uh, like I, I, I was born after Yugoslavia fell apart in 92. But I have an interesting experience because uh, I'm Serbian. I lived there until I was 12. And then we moved to Slovenia. Uh, and I lived there for 15 years. So I'm kind of like a Yugoslavia in one still, but never having been part of Yugoslavia. And I guess what I noticed from my friends in Belgrade, my friends in Maribor, is that we don't we don't have that like sense of Yugo nostalgia or um, like any memories of Yugoslavia because we didn't live there. But I feel like we're still like very connected, and I think people a lot like I know that. Everyone from Slovenia loves going to Belgrade and they love Serbian people and I know the Serbian people really love Slovenia and that but I What about Croatian? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why are you not mentioning Croatia? I, I, love, I love Croatia too, but like I, I just well, don't you should say it. <laughs> I just don't know it enough, but I have a lot of Croatian friends as well. Um, a lot of them also come to Slovenia and I had them at my university because they came to study there. Uh, so I don't know, I don't think are us, the new generation, I don't think we have the Tugo nostalgia. I think for me, kind of like probably if you want your brother thinks, it, to me it seems like it was based on a bunch of lies, and while, it was, while Tito was alive, it, everything was perfect and everyone was happy, but in reality it couldn't have worked. I don't, and like you said, I don't think it could have worked. And I have like, but uh, my, my family was not uh, communist, they were anti-communist, most of my family was like doctors and dentists. Uh, both two of my grandparents were sent to the Goli Otak when they were uh, 23, basically just for studying to become doctors. So to me, like I don't have any like romantic feelings about it. But I do kind of appreciate that sense of like connect, connecting all the countries, and I like that. And I kind of have that with living in Slovenia and still going to Serbia feeling at home in both countries. But to relate to the identity question that you had before, for me it's very interesting when I, like I just moved to London and like you know when people ask me, oh so where are you from? <laughs> I'm like, do you have 10 minutes for me? Because like I feel, of course I'm Serbian, I'm always going to be Serbian, but at the moment I only have a Slovenian passport. Uh, so <laughs> I am both, I mean, you know, I don't know. Well, you know, you know what I mean. Like it's very about about forgetting the there's a very good parallel, although they're very different countries, between Yugoslavia and Austria Hungary, in a sense that a century on it is not forgotten, and some people are nostalgic for it, and even the people that were struggling to leave it, like the Hungarians, are kind of trading on Austro-Hungarian past and getting tourists in to eat Austro-Hungarian cakes, etc., etc. So it's a kind of mixture. I don't think Yugoslavia will, uh, it will be forgotten eventually, but not for a few centuries. Yeah, I think, just to add a tiny bit up to the end of that, that um, there are so many examples of, of that kind of secondary trauma, or whatever you want to call it, in terms of things that, like, say that you know there's a there's a leak in the top floor and you don't know that it's going on but you do see the wet patch or you do start to see the ceiling caving in and I think that there's still a kind of curiosity about the what I mean I'm not talking about Yugoslavia even but just anything in terms of it seems inexplicable maybe to younger generations but they are but they can look at their own parents or they can look at their grandparents and start to question why their personalities or whatever it is has been shaped by those kind of material circumstances and I think that that's something that maybe in terms of Yugoslavia might not be considered but I definitely think that it's I mean it's why I'm writing about it now and I'm technically for my sins a millennial so <laughs> yeah, for some of our for the generation of our grandparents it was almost like a saying you know for those who died before 
the solution of Yugoslavia that they were lucky that they didn't kind of uh, be there to see that kind of uh, falling apart and that is also a story in your film that uh, your grandfather who fought for it you know and strongly believed in it uh, actually died with it in a way you know he couldn't cope with uh, that uh, uh, demise uh, of a country meaning I was 18 when uh, the uh, dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia started and it's still something that I, I'm kind of a coping with, you know. It's, it's, for me, it's extremely difficult to say that I'm from Serbia because I never lived in Serbia. When I left in 99, it still wasn't called Serbia. My all, let's say, our life, I lived uh, in, uh, in the Socialist Soviet Republic of Yugoslavia and I still introduce myself as coming from former Yugoslavia and that is going to be my identity until, until the end, you know. But there is this... I uh, think there is um, uh, an American political uh, kind of a, I mean, a scholar and, and theorist, uh, Wendy Brown, and she has this kind of theory of wounded attachments, you know, that sometimes you, you're mostly attached to your wounds, you know, and you, that is the last thing to, that you give up on, you know. So for us who had that lived experience in Yugoslavia and being kind of dismantled in front of your eyes, you know, almost like ripped apart, because when Slovenia um, kind of a unilaterally kind of claimed, you know, independence. It was next day recognized by Germany and then Austria and so on. So you all see like that kind of a thing being allowed to happen and you don't want that to happen. And as Western said, if we Yugoslavs were kind of a concentrated, maybe there will be still that place. So there is a wound, you know, in some of us, kind of quite open and uh, something that probably will never heal. Can I just uh, jump in here, since I mentioned Austria-Hungary, and I thought this is silly, I should mention United Kingdom. So when I, was, um, when I was doing my readings, I would sometimes say just like that, well, I don't care about that, I'm English now. And then various English people say, no, you can't be English, you can only be British, because English is ethnicity. You know? And so I thought, no, no, I'm deliberately saying I'm English because I want to short-circuit things in case uh, UK falls apart. I want to be on the safe. I want to be on the safe ground. And it was actually quite funny because it hits the nerve because United Kingdom also came together for some very good reasons. Yet you see Scotland now falling apart a little bit and God knows what will happen. And maybe in a century will be kind of our successes will be having this same conversation about United Kingdom. Was it doomed? And the only thing you could say is it came together for a very good reason. That, that's something I encountered a little bit in my kind of reading and, and so on is, is that very smug, like I, I would meet um, sort of older white male people who would define themselves as English and they would say, oh, it's such it, you know, like, you're a Serb. One said, strong as the ox. And I was just like, I don't know how to respond to this very racially charged. <laughs> anyway, but I, I remember thinking they had this incredible smugness that um, the nothing so barbaric could ever happen in, in, you know, the United Kingdom that they would behave so kind of rationally and all the kind of narratives that lots of people in the West hear about the Balkans as being this kind of bloodthirsty barbaric place like well look at what's happening now in our bloody parliament you know it just it's tearing itself apart and I and I just sort of feel like it's it's not specifically even a Yugoslav story so much as what happens when people try and do this yeah, uh, yeah. I have a question uh, for you Vesla if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit of discussion you mentioned earlier uh, when you discuss with friends, I think, about what would happen in Yugoslavia if it was still alive nowadays? Well, um, the experience of my generation was that it was, you would, if you came to Yugoslavia coming from uh, Bulgaria or from Romania, it looked like the West. If you came to Yugoslavia coming back from Italy or Austria, it looked as though it was in the Eastern Bloc. So it was that place in between. But what made it look as it was from the West was that you already had a lot of very strong private business tradition. There were small businesses, but they were so. Sarajevo was known for its cafes that were excellent. In Belgrade, you had these restaurants. People were allowed to employ up to five people. There were sort of beginnings of some kind of economic liberalization. And if you imagine Yugoslavia as a whole in the EU, you would have 
literally hundreds of people like Roxanne Deilincic, fashion designer, selling things. You would have a lot, there was a lot of talent in that country. And I think it would have been, it could have been, a very wealthy, tri thriving big place. The, the problem that, that I had, and we had sort of really thinking about it, and Vladimir mentioned that, is the wretched problem of, of Albanian population in Kosovo, which is absolutely intractable because it is a different language and because there is a pull of that different country there. So that was a kind of, in a way, that, that is something that you can only bypass when you think what would happen to that. But the rest of Yugoslavia, I could only see absolutely flourishing. And I actually think that both the Slovenes and the Croats that you know, are now already in the EU, would be economically better off in the EU with Yugoslavia. It's, I, I understand why people want to separate, and I don't want to impose the idea on anyone, you know. These are lovely countries, Slovenia, Croatia, have been to both since they separated, good luck to them. But I think they would have been better off as the whole country in the EU. I live in Bosnia and uh, I just came here for the exhibition and the panel that we will have tomorrow. So uh, it's really different, the, the search for identity that I can see here from you who don't actually live in your countries, but you live abroad. And it's a different kind of a search for identity for us who actually live there. And uh, I just spoke to my friend Maria just an hour ago, uh, what kind of battles we are fighting every day. You can even not imagine that maybe could be a fiction for you, but it's really different. So I would actually like to use the opportunity to call the audience, maybe to come tomorrow and to uh, talk about different kinds of searching for identity. Yeah, definitely, the exhibition uh, that is uh, on the first uh, floor, uh, which we had uh, previously uh, here on the on the screen. Uh, the storytelling uh, is uh, recommended and also the panel is uh, 4 o'clock, tomorrow 4 o'clock, yeah, so where you will hear from the people who are still in the region uh, with their stories and perspectives. So uh, I just had to add because we met in Sarajevo a couple of months ago and we completely fell in love with each other, but um, in this Yugoslavian story in a way is still over there, works, exists, it's not called Yugoslavia, it's called now, it's called the region. Uh, but from outside and from inside, we, we have to somehow be together and exchange experiences. And uh, from outside, if you look for any grant, for example, you're always going to uh, have your partners from Bosnia, Macedonia, they're always going to put you in the same basket. So you need to work together and we actually like to do this. So whether it's sport or culture or uh, we have the same political problems, we have the same problems with corruption, with rivers, I don't know, you name it. Practically the problem, except Slovenia, who is a bit more advanced, but we have the same, the same problem with nationalism everywhere. So um, we know that uh, the problems that we have we just need to change the experiences to try to solve it. This kind of, uh, this, this still exists at the end of Yugoslavia. We don't call it that like that anymore, it's called the region, but it, it still kind of exists and the parties are still the best in Sarajevo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned, uh, Olivia, you mentioned uh, PKK and Ocelan and Rojava, and this is uh, one thing, when I said this Balkan Socialist Federation, you know, maybe there will be time, and we hope, Vladimir Dube, uh, that uh, we are moving uh, actually beyond the uh, nation states, you know, into some international vision, you know, which Rojava is offering at the moment, because that's a woman revolution in the first place, and then else, uh, actually thinking beyond, thinking uh, beyond nation kind of boundaries, you know. It's more like people who are, yeah, cooperating, collaborating, and living together, regardless of ethnicity, or aiming to have um, like a state with a name, yeah, but more like a yeah. region. You are not convinced. We'll talk later. <laughs> Do we have more questions? Yes. <laughs>